Welcome. In this session, we are going to talk about orbital tubers of neural and mesenchymal origin. Starting with tumors of neural origin, for better understanding, we can divide tumors originating from nervous system into those arising from the central nervous system and those arising from the peripheral nervous system. Now, the structure in the orbit belonging to the central nervous system is the optic nerve. Astrocytes and oligodendrocytes are found only in the central nervous system. Astrocytes providing structural and nutritional support to nerve cells and oligodendrocytes producing the myelin sheath of the white matter. So gliomas arising from astrocytes and meningiomas arising from oligodendrocytes are found only in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. So gliomas and meningiomas in the orbit occur only in the optic nerve. Cranial nerves 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 constitute the peripheral nervous system structures in the orbit. In the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells produce the myelin sheath and astrocytes and oligodendrocytes do not occur in the peripheral nervous system. So neurofibromas originating predominantly from Schwann cells and Schwannomas originating from the Schwann cells are found only in the peripheral nervous system and in the orbit occur in cranial nerves 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Optic pathway glioma and meningioma we have discussed in the section on neuroophthalmology and we are not going to discuss them any further in this session. Neurofibromas are benign tumor arising within the nerve sheath and are chiefly composed of proliferating Schwann cells but also may contain axons and endoneural fibroblasts. Immunohistochemically, they are positive for S100, S100 being a marker for cells arising from the neural crest. As we have mentioned, Schwann cells produce myelin in peripheral nervous system. And two types of neurofibroma have been described, the plexiform neurofibromas and the discrete neurofibromas. Plexiform neurofibromas are more common in the orbit. Plexiform neurofibromas have an onset in the first decade of life and they are infiltrating non-encapsulated lesions with vascularization. And because of its infiltrating nature, it can involve orbital fat and muscles and also the cavernous sinus and can invade the anterior cranial fossa in which situation it becomes lethal. And plexiform neurofibromas are known to have a small risk of malignant transformation. Plexiform neurofibromas are considered characteristic of neurofibromatosis 1. And in neurofibromatosis 1 patients, greater wing of the sphenoid bone can also be absent, causing pulsatile proptosis. Plexiform neurofibromas in the periorbital region usually affects the lateral aspect of the upper eyelid as seen in this picture and on palpation the lesion feels like a bag of worms. There is an S-shaped eyelid deformity as we see here and the overlying skin can be thickened. Neurofibromas are hypo-intense on T1 weighted images and hyper-intense on T2 weighted images as compared to muscles and neurofibromas have variable contrast enhancement. Treatment is surgical removal and it is indicated only if there is visual compromise or significant disfigurement. Discrete neurofibromas can be removed completely with minimal risk of recurrence. However, plexiform neurofibromas are infiltrative and are difficult to remove completely with risk of recurrence. Schwannomas are benign proliferation of Schwann cells within the perineurium. So whereas neurofibromas arise predominantly from Schwann cells but also have components of neural tissue and fibroblasts, Schwannomas are said to arise only from Schwann cells. And histopathologically they have alternating zones, one zone having a solid compact pattern with nuclear palisading called Veroque bodies and the pattern is called Antony A pattern and the other zone has a loose mixoid appearance called Antony B pattern and these two zones alternate throughout the tumor. Schwannomas are also positive for S100 which signifies neural crest origin and a negative for Alcyon blue stain. Schwannomas usually present between 20 to 50 years of age with a painless slowly developing non-axial or axial proptosis and patients may develop diplopia as well as visual compromise. They may also invade intracranially. So here we find a patient with a schwannoma in the superior orbit causing inferolateral displacement of the globe. 
On imaging, we find a well-defined solitary mass with cystic spaces and are usually extraconal in the superior orbit. So this is unlike cavernous hemangiomas. They are fusiform in shape with long axis oriented anterior posteriorly along the inborn nerve. So here we see a fusiform tumor with a horizontally oval orientation and the tumor is hypo intense in T1 weighted images and iso intense in T2 weighted images compared to muscle. Being well encapsulated it can be removed completely still hypercellular schwannomas have a tendency to recur and rarely it may undergo malignant transformation which usually occurs in patients with neurofibromatosis. Malignant schwannomas also called malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors are rare and they can occur either alone or in patients with neurofibromatosis and usually presents between 20 to 50 years with a painful proptosis along with chemosis, diplopia and visual compromise. Malignant schwannomas demonstrate bone destruction on imaging and they usually invade middle cranial fossa and metastasizes to the lungs. They have an extremely poor prognosis even after wide surgical excision, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Neuroblastomas are the second most common malignant orbital tumor in childhood after rhabdomyosarcoma and it is usually a metastasis but rarely can be primary. Being a metastasis, we will be discussing it on the session on orbital metastatic tumors. Next we come to mesenchymal tumors and the most important among them is rhabdomyosarcoma. It is the most common primary orbital malignant tumor in childhood and it arises from undifferentiated pluripotential mesenchymal stem cells of the orbit which normally differentiate into striated muscles. Rhabdomyosarcomas do not directly originate from striated muscles in the orbit but arise from mesenchymal stem cells which are normally destined to become striated muscles. Rhabdomyosarcomas in the periocular region usually occurs in the orbit but can also occur in the lid and conjunctiva and in the orbit it can occur in any quadrant but most commonly supranasally. Average age of onset of rhabdomyosarcoma is 5 to 7 years with a sudden onset and rapid progression of unilateral axial and non-axial proptosis. The rapid progression of the tumor may be mistaken as being due to orbital cellulitis. If the onset is in early teens, the progression is slower and the prognosis is better as we will be discussing. Superficial lesions have associated edema and discoloration of the overlying skin and they may have ptosis and diplopia. So if we compare clinical features of rhabdomyosarcoma with capillary hemangiomas, both having a predilection for the supranasal orbit, a rapid progression and superficial discoloration of the skin, rhabdomyosarcomas have an average age of onset between 5 to 7 years, whereas capillary hemangiomas enlarge only in the first year of life. CT and MRI imaging localizes the tumor and the tumor appears to be irregular but a well circumscribed mass of uniform density. Bone erosion is uncommon but if present has a poorer prognosis and rhabdomyosarcomas are hyper intense in both T1 and T2 as compared to muscle on MRI. Biopsy must be urgent and requires a high degree of suspicion particularly if there is absence of pain in a rapidly progressing proptosis in a child and biopsy is done through an anterior orobitotomy and if the tumor appears to have a pseudo capsule a complete excision may be feasible during biopsy otherwise debulking of the tumor appears to improve response to radiotherapy and chemotherapy the primary modalities of treatment of rhabdomyosarcomas cross triations are better visible in electron microscopy which shows both actin and myosin filaments compared to light microscopy and myoglobulin is a histochemical marker for rhabdomyosarcomas. On histopathology, orbital rhabdomyosarcomas can be of four types having different prognostic implications. There is the embryonal, the alveolar, the pleomorphic and the botryoid types. The embryonal type is the most common constituting more than 80% of rhabdomyosarcomas and it usually occurs in the supranasal quadrant and histopathologically it consists of loose fascicles of spindle cells and only few cells among them show cross striations with trichrome stain indicating origin from stem cells 
destined to become striated muscles. Embryonal abdomen sarcoma have a good prognosis with a 5 year survival rate of 94%. Alveolar abdomen sarcomas constitute 9% of all orbital abdomen sarcomas and they usually occur in the inferior quadrant and histopathologically they are divided into compartments by fibrovascular strands. And within these compartments lie the round rhabdomyoblasts. Alveolar rhabdomyosarcomas have the poorest prognosis with a 5 year survival rate of 65%. The pleomorphic type is the least common but with the best prognosis. Occurs in older children and are the most well differentiated type with cross striations being easily seen with trichrome stain. The 5 year survival rate of patients with pleomorphic type of rhabdomyosarcoma is 97%. Botryoid rhabdomyosarcomas have a grape like appearance and it is said to be a variant of the embryonal type and it does not occur primarily in the orbit but occurs secondarily in orbit after spread from sinuses or the conjunctiva. Along with biopsy, a patient suspected of having rhabdomyosarcomas need to undergo a metastasis workup also. Preauricular and cervical lymph nodes may be involved, a chest radiography should be done and bone marrow biopsy as well as cerebrospinal fluid analysis should be done during the orbital biopsy. After biopsy and metastasis workup, rhabdomyosarcoma is staged as localized tumor, regional spread, residual tumor following incomplete resection and distant metastasis. Radiation therapy and chemotherapy are the primary modalities of treatment of rhabdomyosarcoma. However, radiation can cause cataracts and in children can cause bone hypoplasia. And presently, exenteration is reserved only for recurrent tumors. Rhabdomyosarcoma has a 5 year survival of more than 90% with appropriate treatment. And as we have mentioned, the prognosis of rhabdomyosarcoma worsens with invasion of orbital walls and orbital rhabdomyosarcomas have a better prognosis than those in the head and neck region because of early presentation and relative lack of orbital lymphatics. Other sarcomas which can occur in the orbit in children include fibrosarcoma, liposarcoma, chondrosarcoma and osteosarcoma and they occur particularly in children with heritable retinoblastomas with or without exposure to radiation therapy for the retinoblastoma. On imaging, osteosarcomas and chondrosarcomas show destruction of normal bone and calcified areas. Fibrous histiocytoma is the most common primary orbital mesenchymal tumor in adults, with the average age of presentation being 40 to 60 years. It may also occur in children with heritable retinoblastoma following radiotherapy for the retinoblastoma. Fibrous histiocytoma arises from both fibroblastic and histiocytic cells and usually occurs in the supranasal quadrant. Characteristically, fibrous histiomas are very firm in consistency and easily displace adjacent structures. And the most important characteristic of fibrous histiocytoma is they are locally aggressive in nature. On imaging, we find a heterogeneous tumor with moderate enhancement. And on histopathology, cells are found to be arranged in a story form pattern. Two thirds of fibrous histiocytoma are benign with a fine capsule and are slow growing. However, one third of fibrous histiocytoma are malignant in nature with infiltrative features and they present as a rapidly growing tumor with associated pain. Benign fibrous histiocytomas can be excised, but malignant fibrous histiocytomas require exenteration and recurrence rate after surgical removal is as high as 30%. Radiotherapy and chemotherapy are not effective. Solitary fibrous tumors or SFTs are composed of spindle shaped cells which are positive for CD34 and STAT6 immunohistochemically. CD34 is also found in fibrous histiocytoma but STAT6 is more specific for SFTs. SFTs are well defined encapsulated hypercellular and hypervascular tumors and some of them were previously designated as hemangiopericytomas. They occur in the middle age and one peculiar characteristic of SFTs is that histologically benign SFTs can metastasize while histopathologically malignant SFTs may remain localized. On imaging it resembles cavernous hemangioma and it requires complete surgical excision 
and intraoperatively the tumor appears characteristically bluish. Desmar tumors or juvenile fibromatosis is a benign well differentiated tumor composed of mature fibroblasts and in the orbit the most common location of Desmar tumors is the antero inferior quadrant of the orbit. Desmar tumors are also locally aggressive with a tendency to recur after excision but Desmar tumors do not metastasize. Fibrous dysplasia is a benign lesion in which there is a fibrooseous replacement of developing bone resulting in abnormal expansion of bone compressing adjacent structures as well as pathological fractures. It may be monoostotic in which only one bone is involved or polyostotic in which multiple bones are involved and fibrous dysplasia involving the periorbital area is usually monoostotic. It presents in the second and third decades of life and slowly progresses till bone maturation ceases when it stops growing. In the orbit it can cause fracture of optic canal resulting in vision loss as well as proptosis, asymmetry of the face and orbit along with pain. So here we find asymmetry of the face as well as the orbit in a patient with fibrous dysplasia. Association of fibrous dysplasia with cutaneous pigmentation and endocrine dysfunction is called Macune Albright syndrome. These photographs belong to a patient with Macune Albright syndrome with fibrous dysplasia. Endocrine dysfunction represented by abnormal appearance of the pituitary area and cutaneous pigmentation here in the neck region. CT scan shows the involved bone to have radiolucent and radioopaque areas as seen here we have both radiolucent and radioopaque areas with intact cortical bone on the surface. So the lining of the involved bone is intact cortical bone. MRI does not show dural enhancement which is found in meningioma. Histopathologically we find trabeculae of immature woven bone interspersed with fibrous tissue and this appearance on histopathological sections is called Chinese character appearance. If symptomatic, fibrous dysplasia lesions should undergo surgical debulking. Juvenile ossifying fibroma is radiologically similar to fibrous dysplasia but histopathologically is characterized by presence of osteoblasts. It is a more locally invasive tumor than fibrous dysplasia and so early excision is recommended. Osteoma is a benign slow growing bone tumor and can present with proptosis, compressive optic neuropathy and orbital cellulitis from obstructive sinusitis. CT scan shows the involved bone to be well defined and densely hyperostotic. Most osteomas require no treatment unless symptoms develop. Thank you for listening.